So good evening everyone. So today I will be discussing dengue fever, a very quick review. So you all know, and this will be based upon the national guidelines for the management of dengue 2014 as well as 2020 and WHO dengue guidelines 2016. We all know that dengue fever is a tropical infection and it is endemic in India and it is caused by dengue virus. Dengue virus has four serotypes and the vector, the most common vector is Aedes aegypti, which we know is a daytime biting mosquito. As I already said, there are four serotypes. So how is it? If you get a dengue infection, are you protected against subsequent dengue infections? Yes, you have a protection for the next two to three months only. In case of dengue, what happens is that after the first two or three months, you are susceptible to get another secondary dengue infection, this time with a different serotype. But what happens during the second or subsequent infection is that there is a phenomenon called antibody dependent enhancement of infection. That means instead of the antibodies blocking the entry of virus into your body, here the antibodies facilitate the entry of virus into the body, leading on to increase in viral load, increase the cytokine response to it and a worser infection. So it's always the secondary dengue infection that is worse than the primary or the first dengue infection. Now coming to what is the pathophysiology? What exactly happens in dengue? Why is dengue a killer disease? The main pathophysiology in dengue is it causes severe capillary endotheliopathy. That means your blood vessel endothelium is damaged as a result of which fluids and proteins leak out through the capillaries. And once they leak out, the intravascular volume comes down leading on to shock. When there is shock and hypoperfusion, naturally there is a DIC, microthrombi are formed, consumptive coagulopathy leading on to hemorrhage. And all this would lead on to multi-organ dysfunction and death. This is how capillary leakage or endotheliopathy damages a patient with severe dengue. Now, why does capillary endotheliopathy happen? It may be because of the direct invasion of the virus, but that looks slightly unlikely because it happens later in the stage of a dengue infection. It can be due to the cytokine storm or due to the antigen antibody reaction, which causes damage to the capillary endothelium. Now, how does a dengue manifest? We should know that 90% of the dengue are asymptomatic. Only 10% of dengue infections are really symptomatic. And even when symptomatic, most of them just behave like a viral fever without any complications. It is only 10% which goes on to develop a dengue hemorrhagic fever or a dengue shock syndrome. So now when do you suspect dengue or what are the clinical features? If a patient has fever with any two of the following, that is headache, orbital pain, lethargy, thrombocytopenia, arthralgia or myalgia, and rash. So as you can see, these are all very common symptoms that often we encounter in a viral fever. So if any two are positive, especially if you have a bleeding manifestation, even in the form of a positive tourniquet test, leukopenia with a rising hematocrit, definitely dengue is a possibility. Now, what are, how do they look like? When you look at the dengue patient, are there any skin manifestations? Are there any glaring clinical features? One of the commonest manifestation in dengue is generalized erythema. The baby looks red in color. And what you see here is the impression sign. That is when you keep your fingers or keep your stethoscope on that, you can see an impression there forming. So that is the severe erythema that you see in dengue. You can see frank petechiae or sometimes bleed, even from mucosal bleed can be seen. And during recovery, some patients develop erythema of the lateral margin of the sole, which is also known as the surat sign. So these are some of the common clinical um, skin manifestations that you come across. Now, how do you classify dengue? We already said every dengue is not severe. There are different forms of dengue. So dengue can be classified as mild, moderate or severe. What is a mild dengue? Mild dengue is just like a viral fever. It's an undifferentiated fever. Nothing specific to say in that. Just like an ordinary viral fever. Moderate dengue is dengue happening in a patient with comorbidity. That is a patient who already has a hypertension, diabetes, immunodeficiency, any chronic disease. And if he is getting a dengue, you call it 
you can classify them under moderate dengue because there is a chance of complication. Similarly, dengue with features of warning sign is also taken as moderate dengue and which includes dengue hemorrhagic fever grade 1 and grade 2. Now, what is severe dengue? Severe dengue is a patient who has severe capillary leak leading on to profound shock, severe hemorrhage, multi-organ involvement, like you can have dengue encephalitis, dengue myocarditis, dengue hepatitis, this is what you call it as expanded dengue syndrome or severe metabolic derangement. So these are the four conditions which come under severe dengue. So this would also involve the traditional dengue hemorrhagic fever, grade three and grade four. Now, what exactly is this dengue hemorrhagic fever? Dengue hemorrhagic fever basically means that the patient with dengue fever is having a thrombocytopenia, that is platelet less than 1 lakh, with a PCV more than 20% from the baseline. So this is again graded into 4. Grade 1 is someone who's not having any overt bleeding, but when you do the tourniquet test, you can find petechiae in the elbow, that is you're inflating the BP cuff and you're seeing that. DHF2 is a patient with mild spontaneous skin bleeds. DHF3 is a patient who's having narrow pulse pressure or hypotension with palpable pulses. And DHF4 is a patient with profound shock. That means absent pulse situation. So this was the older classification. And now when we classify mild, moderate and severe, this is still part of it. Now, what are the phases of dengue? Or once you get a dengue fever, symptomatic dengue, how does it progress? Dengue fever classically has three phases, a febrile phase, a critical phase, and the recovery phase. Febrile phase is the initial one to three days when it behaves like just any other viral fever. Then starts the critical phase, and critical phase is usually characterized by subsidence of fever. So that is peculiar of dengue, right? Normally, you expect that when the fever comes down, the child has to improve. But in this condition, when the fever is coming down, you will find that the platelet is also decreasing, the total count is also decreasing, but the PCV seems to be increasing, and child starts developing warning signs followed by shock followed by hemorrhage so this critical phase you should know that lasts for 24 to 48 hours so if you are able to tide over this 48 hours then starts the recovery phase or the convalescent phase where the platelet starts increasing your total count starts increasing the patient feels better the appetite improves the fluids get reabsorbed and there is diuresis. There's a good urine output that is happening in the recovery phase. So it's important for you to know that every patient with symptomatic dengue will not necessarily go through all the three phases. Some may not go to the critical phase at all. They may from the febrile, they may straight away go for recovery also. So now you know what are the three phases of dengue and this is one of the classical skin signs of dengue that is eyes of white in a sea of red and this is commonly seen during the recovery phase. Now coming to the management. So if the patient is coming to you in the first three days of fever onset that is febrile phase all you need to do is reassure the patient, encourage them to take plenty of oral fluids, especially electrolyte rich solutions like ORS, milk, kanye water. Symptomatic treatment with paracetamol may be given and also advise them regarding warning signs. Tell them what are the warning signs, what are the conditions where they should bring back the child and also ask the parents to have a look at the urine output. The baby is passing urine in good quantity more than six times per day. That means the baby is okay. But if the urine output is decreasing, baby is being lethargic, the baby needs to be brought back to the hospital. So this is what you do in a febrile phase. Now starts after the febrile phase is the critical phase. So that usually starts after the third day, lasts for 24 to 48 hours. What exactly are these warning signs? These warning signs are all indicative of capillary leak. It means that this patient is having a capillary endotheliopathy and fluid and proteins are leaking out of the blood vessels. So abdominal pain and tenderness is due to splanchnic hypoperfusion or collection of fluid in the perinephric area. Then you can have fluid accumulation in the form of ascites and pleural effusion. My interstitial edema or fluid leaking out into the brain, increasing the um, intracranial pressure may manifest with increased lethargy, restlessness or persistent vomiting. 
hypoperfusion causing consumptive coagulopathy or low grade DIC may be a reason for mucosal bleeds. Similarly, hepatic congestion and, in, uh, and bleed inside the liver can cause tender hepatomegaly. And all this would be manifested with a progressive increase in hematocrit, often with a fall in platelet count. Remember, even a cold extremities, a narrow pulse pressure or a hypotension with pulse would all be warning signs. So watch out for these warning signs and any of them is present, the child requires admission and fluid resuscitation. Now, how do you manage these children with warning signs or children will come to you with shock? The main management in dengue fever is fluids, fluids, and fluids. So here you treat with fluids, colloids, or blood, depending on the clinical situation that you are encountering. The one thing that you need to remember is avoid hypotonic fluids. Do not use D5 or isolate P for resuscitation. The fluid commonly used is isotonic crystalline, crystalloids, that is normal saline, ringolactate, or in some cases, we also give DNS if the fluid resuscitation is taking a longer time and the dextrose is showing a falling trend. So how do you decide how much fluid has to be given? Remember, the main concept in dengue is to rate of fluid administration should match the rate of capillary leak. Your main aim is to ensure that urine output is maintained at 0.5 to 1 ml per kg per hour. If you find the urine output is increasing, you need to decrease the rate of fluid administered. If you find that the urine output is not adequate, you need to increase the rate of fluid administered. So if patient presents with warning sign, start with 6 ml per kg per hour. If the patient is presenting with narrow pulse pressure, start with 10 ml per kg per hour. If the patient is presenting to you in hypotensive shock, absent pulse situation, start with 20 ml per kg per of normal saline. And as you can see here, you will give this particular rate for one to two hours. And when you find that the patient is improving, urine output is improving, then you would decrease the rate. And the reduction is almost like 50% of the previous. Starting at 20, come back to 10, then to six, then to three, then to 1.5. And finally, you will stop the IV fluids and give oral fluids. So that is the concept of fluid resuscitation. Now, what if the patient is not improving? Remember, every time the patient is not responding to your fluid bolus or every time you have given a bolus, be it 10 ml per kg or 20 ml per kg, after the bolus, you need to check the PCV or the hematocrit. If the child is not improving and when you check the PCV, you find that the PCV is going on increasing. What does that mean? That means fluid is leaking from the intravascular compartment into the interstitium. The IV fluid that you are giving is not remaining inside the intravascular space. It is all going to the interstitial space. So you would give colloid. Normally we give hexastatch. 10 ml per kg over one hour, this would ensure that more of the, as far as colloids are considered, they remain inside the intravascular volume for a longer period of time than your crystalloids like normal saline or ringolactate. So if the PCV is high and is not responding to fluid boluses, go ahead and give colloid. Now what if your child is not improving and when you're checking the PCV, you find that the PCV is falling. That means that this child is not improving, not because the fluid is not getting retained inside the intravascular compartment, but because the child is losing blood from somewhere. Remember, when a dengue child ble bleeds, every time you will not be able to see overt bleed. Some may have massive hematemesis and epistaxis, whereas many would have inside bleed, that is hidden bleed. So a unstable child with a low PCV is a definite indication for giving blood transfusion. So this is how you commonly manage. And once they come, uh, once the BP stabilizes, stop the fluids as early as possible, allow them to diurise of their own. If you go continue your fluids beyond the 48 hours, there is a high chance that you will cause fluid overload during the resorptive phase or convalescent phase and even pulmonary edema can happen. So this is the basic concept of treatment. Your febrile phase, you're giving symptomatic management and oral fluids. Critical phase, depending on the degree of severity, you are giving IV fluids. 
your convalescent or recovery phase, you're stopping all IV fluids and allowing the baby to recover of his own. And finally, how do you confirm the diagnosis? Why am I telling it the last? Because dengue is a clinical diagnosis and the treatment starts even before confirmation of diagnosis. And all you need to manage in a dengue case is mainly the PCV or the hematocrit. You have a, a note that I haven't talked anything about platelet because platelet count does not decide the management. So how do you confirm the diagnosis? Either you have direct methods. That is, these are the investigations you would send when the child presents to you with fever within five days of onset. You can either do a viral culture, you can look for the genome through PCR, or you look for the NS1 detection through antigen. Remember, NS1 antigen is the commonest one test that you do in the first five days. And especially if it is done by ELISA, it is confirmatory. If the patient presents to you after five days, then there is high chance that all these direct methods may not be positive. So you would have, because by this time, the virus would have disappeared and the antibody would have appeared. So after five days, if you want to diagnose, dengue, you can look for serology, especially IgM with macalysa is confirmatory, or you can look for IgG. Remember, IgG positivity does not indicate current infection. It may indicate a previous infection. But if you have a seroconversion, that means you had initially checked IgG, it was negative. When you repeated the IgG, it became positive. Or if you find that initially the IgG levels were low, but subsequently when you check the IgG, there has been a fourfold rise. So zero conversion and fourfold rise are definite confirmation for present acute dengue infection. I hope a brief uh, review was useful for you. Thank you. And if anyone wants uh, to know more about the real management of dengue, especially in an ICU setting, I have shared the link in the description box. You can watch that. Thank you.